Okay, welcome. Uh, I think we have a quorum now, so uh, welcome. This is the fourth and final class of the Gardeners for Beginning, GFB. Uh, I'm confident uh, over the past three classes uh, that you've come to recognize the and appreciate the uh, passionate talent that uh, the Master Gardeners instructors, instructors have demonstrated in these final classes. So, uh, the team has dedicated considerable time, effort, and coordination in bringing this class to you. And, and hopefully, uh, this these classes clearly present uh, the effort that's been put in. So, uh, anyway, hopefully, you've uh, got a lot out of it. And this final class, we will talk about it right now. So, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about basic tools. Basic tools, Paul will present that. These are pretty much the uh, tools you'll pretty much see in most of the gardens. So some of them maybe you don't have and some of them you need. Uh, so anyway, Paul will be covering that. Uh, Denise will talk about prep for planting. planting. So uh, we've talked a lot about up to now about the plant, plant's needs. So now it's time to talk about the preparation for the actual planting. And then, uh, I'll be talking about the plan for water. Again, we've talked a lot about water. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the different system, watering systems and the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the idea there's no perfect watering system, but we'll, we'll explain a few things. Transplanting, the Louise will, will, will talk about that. Um, and now that you've brought the seedlings home from the nursery uh, or grown from seeds, uh, how do you transplant to, to larger pots or are you even in the ground? So uh, chatting about that. Then it comes maintenance, which is uh, be presented by Susan. The final step, it's the maintenance and the harvesting of all the work that you've done up to now. So uh, anyway, that's an important section. And then the Q&A is always a little, have that at the end. So that's, that's, this week. Let's talk about uh, what we covered last week. Uh, questions we covered uh, related to last week's class. I don't think we had any. Uh, Susan will talk about uh, how are your seedlings and then uh, Paul will review uh, the whole. So let's talk about last week's class. Susan talked about 10 popular plants uh, that you run into. In, Rosemary, we talked. She talked about water requirements, sun requirements, and you know they all vary, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, rosemary, chives, lettuce, tomato, uh, some flowers, sunflowers, uh, fuchsia, and citrus trees. So, anyway, that uh, so you've uh, realized that uh, you can't treat all plants the same. Uh, shopping for plants. Um, I think Susan took us into the nurseries. What to look for? The labels. Uh, what to buy. Uh, so uh, that's what she talked about. And then growing plants from seeds. I talked a little bit about why grow uh, from seeds and not just buy transplants. And we talked about some things, some plants don't grow well from transplants, uh, be it root crops. A uh, good example, don't buy a, a six pack of carrots, potatoes, radishes, uh, is probably better from seed. And also other things that are appropriate for seeds, things that have larger seeds are easier to direct seeds. In that category would be beans, peas, and some squash. Um, and the other thing we've talked about, why seeds? Well, if you want something different and not something that, you, that, that, that the nursery wants to sell you, but what you want, uh, a seed is, is a good alternative. The other thing we talked about was it's often the nurseries will have things that aren't ready to plant. Uh, sometimes you'll notice in we have a really warm early March and people go out and buy tomatoes. Well, don't put them in the ground yet. Just because the nursery sells them, that doesn't mean it's appropriate to plant. Them. And then finally, uh, last week, Paul talked about pest diseases and weeds. The takeaway here should be there's a website, the IPM, and that has just an amazing amount of information uh, that you can utilize. Uh, questions? We didn't uh, have any questions from last week's class, so we'll move on. Uh, and uh, Susan will talk about uh, 
how you see this. Thank you, Bob. I'll stop share. Right, if somebody could highlight me so I could show you my seedlings. Anne, were you gonna highlight her? Okay, am I there? Not seeing myself. All right. <laughs> Sorry, my, here's her error. Here's her error. Okay, here we are. These are the seedlings we started in the first class. We have sugar snap peas and radishes. Now, while both of the seeds came up very quickly within a week, and they were showing their heads when we had our meeting on the second class, we were having warm weather then. Weather has changed. And between our class last Friday and this Friday, the temperatures have really dropped, especially at night. And I do keep these little seedlings just outside in my garden. They're sitting on a sunny ledge, but they are out there exposed to all the elements. So, the peas are actually not doing badly at all. The sprouts are about three inches tall and all four of the peas that I planted have sprouted. The radishes, however, don't look too much different from last week. They're still there, they're still growing, but they haven't put out their true leaves still. They're still in the, the primitive stage of growth. So. This has definitely been affected by the change in temperature. So the lesson here is don't be discouraged if you're not seeing a lot of growth when you start your seedlings. You know, the weather could not be, could be cooperating or not cooperating. It was cooperating early and helping us get them up, but it's not cooperating now instead of getting them thriving. All right, that's the story on the seeds. And I think we're going to go to Paul now. All right, so we had a item scavenger hunt. I'm going to whiz through these pretty quickly because we've got a lot of material today. But so a plant that they eat is mildly terrifying. It's all of the above. They pretty much eat everything. So a natural insect enemy of aphids, uh, one of them is the parasitic wasp. Lady beetles are others, although technically it's a larva. Looking after snails and slugs, we try and disrupt their habitat, so remove old boards and things they can hide under. Uh, we talked about lady beetles. Um, one interesting thing is when you look for some of these animals, using the, the sort of the correct scientific name will often get you better results. And in this case, it's lady beetle. Bermuda grass, that's a nightmare plant for gardeners. It spreads underground. So it shoots out these things called rhizomes and they connect and then they kind of pop up in other parts of the, the yard. And they look like they're separate, but they're actually connected underground. It's one of the reasons why they're so difficult to, rem to remove. Perennial weed is the, we've got an example here, yellow nuts edge. Another um, scourge of gardeners is uh, bindweed. If you want to nightmares, look up bindweed root depth. It's pretty amazing. So an annual weed, annual are of course the reseeding plants. Uh, it's, we've got a California bug clover there. Gophers in the garden. You'll see a, a mound of dirt and there's like a little plug at the end that they leave when they're digging tunnels. So yeah, sunburn can affect plants as well. Uh, you've got avocados and uh, tomatoes and basil. Uh, trees of course can get sunburned too. Uh, we recommend uh, mixing white latex paint 50-50 with water and then painting that on the bark and it reflects the sun and gives, gives the tree some protection. Uh, common pest of disease, 
black spot. That's a little fungus. So basic tools. These are the sort of essential tools, I would say. Um, there's a gun you, you're going to have to have. Uh, there's not really, I don't think you can get away with really not having any of these. So let's take a look. Pruners. It's a few different types. Uh, the most common one you're likely to get is the one on the left, the uh, hand pruners. The one on the right is a fold-out saw. Uh, those are good for larger branches that you can't get a, a pruner around. You can get pruners that also are on a on a pole with a with a piece of string. So essentially, you hold up the the pole and then you you pull on the string and it activates the uh, the blades. Uh, those are really useful for getting branches, obviously that you can't quite reach, but you don't want to get a ladder out. So we've got a uh, hand trowel, which is like a kind of a little pickaxe. This is another version of such a thing. These are good for digging out little holes or uh, this is quite a sharp blade that will allow you to get through roots or dig into a more compacted soil. So the, the one in the middle is called a hori hori knife. These are fantastic. They're very, very thick blades, can be quite sharp and they have a uh, typically some kind of measuring uh, for, the, for the inches so you can get your correct depth for planting. So here's some tools from my backyard. The one on the left is a, is a hoe, a uh, hula hoe. You push these back and forth and they're fantastic for removing weeds very, very quickly. The item in the middle is your common shovel. There are different types of shovels. This one, um, they have a point. Um, other ones you'll find are called a transfer shovel. They often have a square, squared or flat end, and they're used for quite literally transferring things. Uh, so if you want to move uh, soil or uh, mulch, for example, you'd use a transfer shovel. The points are good for getting into things and lifting. If you're moving a lot of mulch, it's worth getting a, a larger transfer shovel. And they can be you know, a couple of feet wide, and they're fantastic if you need to move a lot of mulch. Then there's a rake, a compost bin, um, a spading fork. These are all things you're probably familiar with. So the rakes on the left are for moving light material like uh, old leaves through grass where they, a typical metal rake would get caught on um, the, the underlying soil. So the device on the right is fantastic if you have compost. It's called a compost aerator. You can find them online. The offset handles at the top allow you to kind of twist it. And, once, and it twists very quickly into the, into the compost and then you pull it up and it allows you to aerate the, the compost very, very quickly. All right, can you uh, handle it? Actually, before I do that, I've got a couple of extra things here. I just remembered. So it's not strictly a tool, but it's super useful to have. This is a hose repair device. There's two, two metal clamps either side of a, uh, a metal insert. And essentially, you, you cut where the break is in your hose. You push the two either side, and then you put the clamp around it. It can save you buying a new hose. Uh, these are garden clips, also very help, helpful. If you need another spigot, you can buy these like little doubling uh, doodads. Sometimes you can find them with four and then they have a reinforcing pole underneath. And I just recommend walking around the garden store and seeing what you can find. Like for example, here's a specialized type of uh, little trowel that you can use for uh, transferring seedlings into the ground. And finally, these are pruners, and I thought, wow, this is cool. It's got a, it's, it's got a rotating handle. Turns out this is actually a bit of a gimmick. It doesn't work that well, but sometimes it's fun to try out new things. 
Okay, I'm going to hand over to Denise to talk about planning. Paul? Okay, we're going to talk. Oops, I think I went too far there. Let me go back one. So now we're to the point where you probably want to start planting, but before you even buy your plants, you've got to do a little bit more planning. Uh, we've already talked about right plant, right place, and we've talked about resources for helping to choose plants. Now here's where you're actually going to start using all this information that we've given you. So chances are there's, you want to start with a smaller area rather than your whole yard. If you have a very small yard, maybe you'll do the whole thing at once. But if you have even a medium-sized yard, we usually divide it into what we call beds. Um, it's just an area of your garden that is going to have plants that share similar sun, shade, space, and soil requirements. So um, you're going to choose an area of your yard to actually plant. And for that area, you need to uh, make sure you understand it's sun, shade, and soil, and you need to decide how you're going to provide water. And then you'll want to prep the bed. Preparing a garden bed, these are the basic steps you, you'll use. You'll want to eliminate weeds. You want to make sure you have your water figured out, how you're going to get water there. You want to get the soil moisture right before digging, before you dig to either amend the soil or to transplant plants. And you'll be adding soil amendment if it's needed. So let's go through these one at a time. I'm waiting for it to advance. There. Uh, first of all, you'll want to eliminate weeds. This is a person using that hula hoe that Paul talked about. It's a good way to cut the weeds off just below the surface. You just go back and forth and it cuts the weeds off. Um, weeds can, they could also be hand pulled or dug out uh, and perennial weeds like Bermuda grass and bindweed should, you should try to dig out as much as you can by the roots. A hula hoe will not do it. A hula hoe will leave all those roots in there and they'll just re-sprout. Um, if the area you want to garden in has a lot of weeds in it, this can be a very difficult step, but it's really worth it. Um, and also when there are a lot of weeds, there's a lot of weed seeds. So you may find that you pull all the weeds, water it and come back a few days later and you've got a whole batch of new weeds. And that's because the seeds are there in the soil. But if you keep after it, uh, it may take two or three or even more rounds of weeding, um, you will get, get rid of the weeds. And I'm waiting for the next slide to come up. My computer's really slow, I apologize. So this is uh, a, a patch that was planted with garlic. You can see the tall um, plants in the kind of in the middle there and then all the weeds around it. And now it's very difficult to weed because you don't wanna pull up the garlic plants. So you wanna weed before you plant. And, uh, and this is what happens if you don't stay on top of the weeding. You'd also want to weed this before those plants, the weeds get so big. If you have a large space that you're going to be preparing for planting, you may want to do what we call sheet mulching. Again, I'm waiting for the uh, slide to come up. Sheet mulching is uh, another way, if you can start a little bit early and wait a couple of months before you plant, you can do this, which involves smothering, using sturdy cardboard to smother all the plants underneath. There's no need to dig anything out. You just put the cardboard down on top of whatever's growing there. Um, and then you cover it with a deep layer of wood chips. And this will kill the weeds by preventing photosynthesis. There is a website, uh, which I believe is in your handout called lawntogarden.org slash residence. And it has detailed information on how to do this. Um, this is also good for path areas. If it's a place you're not going to be growing anything, <clears throat> excuse me, you can put down cardboard, cover it with mulch and it'll look very nice and the weeds will have a harder time coming up. 
Um, the website that is mentioned here, the lawn to garden .org, uh, does say you can plant right away. You can cut holes in the cardboard and plant plants in the holes in the cardboard if you don't want to wait for everything to, for all the weeds underneath to die. You do have to be careful though that you don't let too much light in for the other plants or for the weed seeds because then the weeds will grow. This next slide shows the area that's been completely covered with mulch. And um, I just wanna say, I've done this in the past. I've got my cousin to do it. It works really well, but it does take uh, a few months to get rid of all the weeds and turn it into nice uh, plantable soil. Okay, once you've got your area free of weeds and you're ready to prep the soil for actual planting, you wanna make sure you have the soil moisture right. Um, and I'm gonna ask Bob to stop sharing for a minute and highlight me so I can show you some soil samples. Maybe I can spotlight myself here. Oh, there I am, okay. So I have three soil samples here. This one, as you can see, is totally dry. If I try to make a ball out of it, it just falls apart. This is way too dry for planting. This one is way too wet. If I take it and make a ball, it makes a ball and it won't fall apart. I can actually squeeze water out of it. I don't know if you can all see that but it's way too wet. What you want is somewhere in the middle so that it's just right, so that you can make a ball out of it and it'll stick together until you push it with your finger and then it falls apart pretty easily. And that's about the level of soil moisture that you want before you start digging the soil to prep. Okay, Bob, can you go back to uh, sharing again? As far as amendments go, you're only going to amend if the plant needs amendments. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before. Sorry, I didn't mean to advance the slide there. A plant, trees and shrubs should be planted in unamended soil and native plants should be planted in unamended soil. That's California native plants, I mean. Um, most annual flowers, vegetables, berries, herbs, and non-native shrubs like ferns, azaleas, and roses, they need well-amended soil. So what's the difference between an amendment and mulch? Organic soil amendments are products that are mixed into the soil for the overall purpose of benefiting plant growth. We contrast that with mulch, which is placed on top of the soil surface to reduce soil moisture loss and water runoff to prevent weeds and to moderate soil temperatures. Soil amendments improve the texture of the soil. They can improve sandy soils, by, by improving the nutrient holding capacity, by adding organic matter, and clay soils are also improved by adding uh, soil amendments, it, which will lead to improved soil aeration. The most important benefit of compost and mulch is that it feeds the soil, all the little organisms that live in the soil, and that will help, um, help plants help the soil release the plant available nutrients as they die off. So if you decide you do need to amend your soil, amending soil means to dig in organic matter like compost. If the soil has been amended well previously, probably all you need to do is just spread an inch of compost and mix it in lightly. For never amended soil, you may wanna do as much as a six inch layer of compost and mix it into the depth of the shovel, which would be about nine to 10 inches. And you may need to do this multiple times with if you have heavy clay soil that's never been amended. Uh, you may, may need to amend it once or twice a year until over time, the soil becomes less clay and more crumbly and easily worked. 
And then once you've done that, then again, you only need to add an inch or so before you plant your new plants. And if you do have problems with gophers, you can either put gopher cages around your plants or gopher wire under the area if it's a small enough area. Okay, now Bob's gonna talk about planting for water. Thank you. Uh, so by now you figured out water is, is important to successful gardening. Uh, you know, we talked in, in uh, class one, we talked about climate, when and how much rain to expect. Uh, let me get my video on, excuse me. Uh, we talked about uh, class two, uh, first mention of hydrozones. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in a bit. And then class three, 10 easy plants all had varying water needs. Uh, so if something is important, it should be planned and, and appropriately provided. So plan watering, uh, decide on your watering systems long before the planning. We'll talk a little bit about some systems. Uh, the slides that follow will describe the three such systems. But first, a little test from class one. Do you remember the name of the climate in our Santa Clara County? Uh, what it's called from our first class. Uh, there may be in the chat and uh, recognize your scores. And give me some uh, attributes uh, about, the, uh, about the climates. What are the summers like? And what are the winters like? Uh, one thing that uh, you do have to remember is that in this climate, be it drop tolerant natives, something uh, indigenous to the, cli to the uh, climate, Cactus succulents, they all need water in their first one or two years, and then very little after that. So let's talk a little bit about, okay, the plan for watering. Uh, got three systems here. One is hand watering. Uh, trust me, the, uh, the hand has actually been cropped out of the photo, but uh, that is, that's the hand watering. It's good for beginners to hand water as, as learning and the garden observation opportunities. Overhead sprinklers down uh, on the left, uh, most, mostly used for installed lawns, and then the drip system. Uh, this is what I recommend for most garden applications. But one thing is important to, to understand is that success in water is situational. It, it really depends. So what I'm gonna talk about in the next couple slides are the pros and cons, the advantages, disadvantages of, uh, of these various three systems. Uh, the one thing you need to realize though, when we talked about, uh, Denise was talking about the planning, you need to plan for your uh, water and irrigation needs long before you put any plants in the ground. So let's talk about hand watering. Let's go through the advantages. Uh, it's very precise placement of water. It's basically point and pour. Uh, I guess my master gardener training was coming through. My son sent me a video of his friend has twin girls, cute as heck. And they had a hose like this on the tomato plants. It may have been a cute picture, but oh my goodness, don't water tomato leaves. That's not a good thing. But with the point and pour, you can kind of determine you know, where the water goes. Uh, the other thing that's really important and a big advantage of this, and Susan will talk about it in, in her uh, presentation here in the fall is a bit, it lets you check on the plants. It lets you get into the garden and look at what's going on. There's nothing I like better than going out in the garden during the growing season and checking what's, what's happening. Uh, this tool can also be a, a tool for, for getting rid of pests. We've seen all these plants full of aphids. Well, with a good stream of water, that'll knock the aphids off, and these aphids aren't getting back on. There are going to be some others that get back on, but not these. And also, it's good for powdery mildew, which you'll see in squashes later in the season. It, it doesn't cure it, but it, it does minimize it. Uh, it's also affordable, uh, pretty easy, uh, you know, getting a hose. Uh, and it's uh, okay most times of the day. You don't have to worry about evaporation because you, you've got the point for it right there. The disadvantages, you know, you really have to be diligent and disciplined. Uh, because 
you know, I, I can't remember what day you, you uh, water last. Uh, you remember how long you did it for or which plant you did. So it does require a fair amount of discipline. The other thing is if uh, you're on the, uh, the hand watering and you go away for a, a vacation in the summer, uh, you better have a good relationship with a neighbor because it's going to require lots of help there. So that's a little bit on the, uh, the hand watering. Overhead sprinklers. Uh, kind of a gentle coverage over a large area. It does wash the leaves, which is, which is an advantage. And once it's set up, it's kind of a low effort. And it's nice to have a little something for the birds and the bees as far as the water. Uh, disadvantages, unlike the hand watering, uh, there's some evaporation that can happen depending on when you're watering. If you're watering in the afternoon, you'll get more evaporation. And uh, if it's windy, uh, some of that is going to you know, go into other areas. Uh, waste water on areas that don't need it. Uh, you know, we haven't had a lot of water these days. And boy, I sure don't want to water concrete and weeds. So uh, that's one of the disadvantages of, of these sprinklers. Uh, also, tall plants can, can, can block the water. Uh, and wet foliage, I, I talked about that, you know, my, uh, these twins watering and tomato plants. Uh, you don't want to get, get the water wet, especially if you get the, the foliage wet uh, in the, uh, uh, during the day and, or in the evening, actually, it doesn't have a chance to dry off. The other thing is, and I did mention it with the, with the point and pour with the hand watering, you can splash the dirt on the plants and sometimes it can uh, bring up some uh, you know, foliar diseases as a result of that. So that's kind of the overhead sprinklers. Uh, See what we got next here. I think we got drip. Okay, um, this is pretty much what I use, but uh, like I said, no system is perfect. Uh, the water is placed accurately and efficiently in the root zone. And, uh, Susan will be talking a little bit about the root zone, but boy, it's really easy to direct not only where the water goes, but how much, because you can have different size emitters. Emitters go anywhere from half a gallon an hour to four or five gallons an hour. So there's lots of variation that you can uh, tailor to the needs of the plant. Uh, obviously, uh, if it's right on the plant in the root zone, and depending on how often you do this and the size of the emitters, you're gonna reduce runoff. And again, with our water shortage, you don't wanna waste water. You wanna make sure all that water goes to the plant. And again, the plant foliage stays dry, so there's less chance of those diseases. If you have a controller, it does take less management. Now that this, I mean, you've got these controllers can be anywhere from a, a battery on a hose ticket, which is connected to a drip. Uh, and that they, they can run maybe 50 bucks to some of these really sophisticated controllers, which are hundreds of dollars. They connect to the internet. They can read uh, and, figure out the weather forecast when rain is coming and adjust accordingly. Now, unfortunately these days, it's pretty easy. The rain's just not gonna be coming. So I'm not sure that's a big deal right now, but you can be fairly sophisticated in some of these controllers. Uh, the biggest downside is the parts such as the emitters need to be inspected regularly. So what can happen is the emitters can blow off they can get misplaced, they can get moved around. And what I've had um, regularly is the squirrels or rats are chewing on these things and they blow all over everywhere and the water is inefficient. So my water comes on at 4 a.m. in the morning. So 4 a.m. watering is a bit like Las Vegas. What goes on at four o'clock in the morning stays at four o'clock in the morning. So what I have to do is every couple of weeks, I turn on all the, the lines and walk the lines to make sure that the emitters are still flowing, they're not clogged, and some of the animals haven't uh, chewed off. Uh, so those are kind of advantages, disadvantages of those three systems. So we talked about the hybrid zone. Let me just revisit this very quickly. Uh, this is where it's kind of a more complicated, we show a simple diagram, but it's kind of, it puts uh, in, in various areas those that have the same requ water requirements. So what you don't want to do is you put, you know, remember in first class you had 
right place, right plant. You know, uh, water requirements for a tomato is way different than azaleas or um, rosemary. So what you want to do in a hydrozone is group the plants according to their water needs. Hydrozone, more of a, a simplified one. Uh, you see the house, you want to get the high water right next to the house. You obviously want to know where the water is, but uh, and kind of determine the high, low, and the medium. So that, that, that's really helpful. Okay, Louise, you're on. Here I am. Let's see. Can you see me? I don't know if you can see yes. me. I'm, I'm seeing. Okay, good. Well, hi, everybody. So now that you have your plants planned, you have done some research and some shopping, you've picked out some plants, and you know you want to put them in your garden, you've got some tools ready that you're going to use, um, you have prepared the soil in your garden by eliminating the weeds and you found a really good spot and you've maybe amended the soil if you need to. Maybe you've got a raised bed that you're gonna put your plants in and you've got that soil ready. You've set your irrigation up so you know how you're gonna provide water to your plants. Now, how do you actually get some plants into the ground? So I'm gonna talk about transplanting and how to do that. Um, transplanting means taking a plant from one container and putting it into another container or into the ground. So first of all, of course, you want to make sure you've got the right plant in the right place. You've got a plant that likes the sun and it's going to go in a place that gets sun. You've got a plant that likes a lot of water and it's going to go in a place in your garden that's going to get a lot of water. That kind of thing. Right plant in the right place based on the plant's needs. Um, when you're going to take your plants and transplant them, you, it's best to do it in cool weather. Um, in the middle of our summers when it's pretty warm is generally not the best time to do a lot of transplanting. If you're going to transplant on, in hot weather, you want to make sure you do it in the evening so the plant has all night to kind of settle in. Um, ideally, you might wait for uh, you know, a few days of fog or something like that and do it when it's cool. Um, again, Bob talked about getting your irrigation set up. So if you're going to have an irrigated area, you want to make sure that's set up first and that your soil is ready. Um, okay, so you want to make sure that the plant is also ready by making sure that that root ball is wet. If it is uh, dried out, don't, don't transplant it that day. Give it a good soaking, let it get really wet, and then you can transplant it maybe the next day. Um, when you do transplant, you want to make sure that you're going to have firm contact between the roots and the soil, that you water afterwards, that if you, um, if you have set up your drip system, that you put that, that, uh, that dripper on the root ball or near the root ball so that that drip gets down to the roots of that plant. And if necessary, there might be some plant support like a stake that that you need to put in, that should be done when you transplant as well. So I'm gonna talk about some of these things a bit more. So if you're talking about seedlings, um, this is, if you, if you take a seedling and you put it into a larger pot before you grow it in that larger pot and then put it in the ground, we call that potting up. I thought that might be a term you might be interested in knowing. It, it, is, a, it is transplanting, but it's also called potting up. Not all potting up is, um, not all plants need to be potted up, but sometimes we do that. Um, when you are going to do this with your seedlings, when you're going to transplant or pot up your seedlings, make sure that you handle them the way it's shown in the upper left by the leaf. These seedlings have multiple leaves, but they only have one stem. So if you damage that little stem, that's pretty much gonna be the end of it for that little plant. But if you damage that leaf, that's probably okay. Plant can continue to grow. So handle them, little seedlings, by a leaf. Um, let's see. Um, in the upper right are some uh, and some broccoli seedlings. Now these are granted; these are very small. When I took these pictures, um, I probably should have waited and and um, let them grow a little bit more. But they did fine, actually. 
Uh, someone in the chat was asking about separating seedlings. And yes, you can separate seedlings uh, just the way they're done there in the upper right. If you do it very gently, their little root balls will come apart and you can then plant them separately. Um, so what you wanna do is you wanna dig a little planting hole that's just the right size for that little, little root ball and that it's deep enough that the roots can just dangle down into that hole and go straight down if possible and lower the seedling down in the hole and then push the soil around and um, make sure that you've got some good firm contact there and that seedling will be fine. Firm it, but don't mash it. Um, and then always water after you have transplanted uh, anything. So you always want to settle the soil by watering it. Um, one thing that you will find with plants from the nursery, and I have some here I'm going to demonstrate with, um, you will often see a coil of, in fact, I'll just pull this out here right now and hold that up. Okay, I'm not seeing myself on the screen, so I'm hoping that you can see me. Um, there we go, now I see myself. All right, so I'm, I'm holding up a plant here, just like the one in the drawing. And you can see that there are often roots coiled around the bottom. This one isn't too bad. Um, in the little picture there, the diagram, you can see the roots are coiled around quite a lot. Um, that is not healthy for the plant in the long run. Remember, Bob told us that plants grow from the tip. That's the same with the roots. The roots grow from the tip. They get longer from the tip. So that coiled mass there that's at the bottom of that plant, that's just going to stay there. It's not going to straighten out. Roots do not uncurl themselves. It's it's sort of a magical thing that we think is going to happen when we put the plant in the soil. We think the roots are going to uncurl. They don't. They will stay in that curl forever. And that's not good for the plant. So you just want to rip that off of there. Um, what will happen is the ends of the roots will peel over and they'll start growing again from the tips and they'll be able to grow down in the soil. This is one of the hardest things for beginning gardeners to do. So I am going to demonstrate that for you. Um, but it, it's, it can be really important. In fact, I think I'll do that now. Bob, could, if you could stop the share. Let's see if I can make this happen. Okay. All right, so I've got some plants here. Uh, these are snapdragons that I got from the nursery. And this is a typical six pack that a nursery will sell. They're very big plants. Ideally, you will buy, you, if you find plants that are smaller, like smaller snapdragons, I would like them smaller. But the nurseries like to sell these bigger plants because people think that they will do better in the garden. But smaller is actually, or younger is actually a little bit healthier. And then I am, I'm also going to wear gloves. That's one of the tools that I consider most important for gardening to protect your hands, uh, just because, um, you know, it's good for your skin, I guess. So you can gently, gently put a couple fingers around the base of that plant and press on the bottom and tip it out of the pot. And in this case, this is a very strong plant. I don't need to worry about handling it by the leaves. It's, it's, a, it's tough, it'll be fine. It's not like the little tiny seedlings we had earlier. Okay, now here I wanna show you if this was worse, I would do the same thing. But even, even here, I'm just going to demonstrate. I'm just going to pull those coiled roots off of there so that I'm exposing little tips. If you have like a gallon-sized um, perennial plant, oftentimes you'll find a big mat of roots at the bottom. Just slice that off with a knife or some or some kind of tool or just yank it off of there. This allows these roots to grow straight down instead of continuing to coil around and um, the plant will be much healthier. And then you take another tool, nice little shovel here. We can say this is either the ground or this is another pot. And I'm planting, this is potting soil. 
And in this case, I'm not going to mash this root, this, this plant at all. These roots are fine as long as I've taken that little mat off there, they'll be just great. You put them, put it down in there. I'm gonna make it a little deeper. So that the top of the root ball here, the top of the root ball is the level with the ground or with the, the pot. Don't bury it over its neck um, with some exceptions. And then you wanna fill in around the plant and I'm going to grab some of this other soil that around there to treat your plants gently. But plants are plants can be pretty tough, actually. And I'm making a mess here. And then it's important to have um, firm, firm down. I'm pressing down. I'm not mashing on it, but I'm pressing down to make sure that that plant has good root contact with the, the new soil. And I made a big mistake. I didn't bring my watering can into my office with me, but always, always, always water your plants, soak them well after you transplant. So that's um, my little demonstration of transplanting. It would look pretty much the same if you were doing that in your garden or uh, in a raised bed. So I hope that helped a little bit. Step this back up, Bob, if you could share the slides again. Okay. So if I can't uh, advance the slides with my gloves on. All right, so a bigger plant like a, oops, let's go back here. Uh, most perennials and shrubs will come in a four inch pot or a gallon size pot. And you wanna basically do the same thing that I showed you with the little plant. Prep the roots by making sure that there's not a lot of coiled roots down at the bottom and that the, the roots will be able to grow straight down into the soil. Um, you wanna dig, make sure that that plant is well watered also. Dig a hole that's as deep as the root ball and about twice as wide. You want to not dig a deep hole. It's, it's not bad if you dig a deeper hole and then fill it back in, but it's, uh, more common nowadays, we recommend that you don't dig a really deep hole, that you, you dig only as down as far as the bottom of the root ball. That way the plant can sit right there on the firmer soil and not settle in. Um, then when you uh, put, the, put the plant into the, into the hole, the picture doesn't show this, but you want to spread those roots out so that they can grow out and downward. Um, into the into that hole. Then adjust the depth by adding soil at the bottom if you need to, to make sure that the top of the plant's crown or the top of the root ball is right at or a, slightly above the ground level. Um, you don't want that, the top of that, the, you don't want the place where the plant meets the soil, that's the crown of the plant. You do not want that to be uh, below ground level. You want it to be slightly above so that it will not rot. Uh, spread those roots out as best as you can and then backfill with um, the soil that you dug out of the hole. Unless you have amend amended soil or you want to use amended soil, if that's an appropriate situation, generally we just want you to plant perennials and shrubs and things like, and trees and things with the native soil. So just backfill with the soil that you dug out of the hole, firm that down there so there's good contact. And then, um, and then you wanna create a, a ring around the plant of a soil, kind of a donut shaped ring that'll hold the water in, call that a watering basin, and then water that plant really well. Give it a chance to settle in. You can add more soil if you need to, if it really settles too much. Um, let's see. Also add mulch over the top of that root ball, but not right up against the stem. So you do wanna make sure that you mulch your perennials and your shrubs and things to keep that soil cool and keep the moisture in the soil. Okay, so that would be transplanting perennials and shrubs and then the only thing I want to say that's different about trees, and again, this picture uh, doesn't really show the roots spreading out. But that's what you want to try to do is get the roots spread out into the hole a little bit. Um, so trees, you plant, plant just the same way I described with the previous slide. 
but staking is often often done wrong with trees. So uh, the thing you want to do with trees is um, make sure that when you plant that tree, you remove any stake that came from the nursery. I see it all the time. People just go ahead and they leave that stake that's that's in the plant from the nursery. They leave that in there, and that's really very it's really bad for the plant. So take that stake out of the soil, away from the plant, take any ties that are on there away, uh, plant that plant the way that tree or that you know, tall bush or whatever, uh, plant it the way I described. And then if you do think that the plant needs support, then you might consider a stake. Not all trees have to be staked. If the tree is holding itself up well by itself, it doesn't need to be staked. But if you think it needs a stake, use two stakes, place them well outside the root ball as shown in this picture. And then you want to use loose ties um, that are as low as you can possibly put those, put those ties and have them do the job that is needed to be done to hold the tree up. So you don't wanna be staking a tree with ties way at the top. You want the ties to be as low as, as is reasonably possible. And the tree should be able to move if a tree can't move, it won't develop trunk strength. So you really want the tree to be able to sway a little bit and that's how the tree will become strong. It's kind of like people and the muscles in their legs. You need to be able to move to become strong. Same with plants. Um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say about trees. And um, otherwise, same as you would be planting like a, a gallon sized perennial. And then another way to get plants in the ground is of course to direct seed. We thought we'd reiterate this a little bit. You can plant things by seed right into the ground. Uh, it's great for radishes and carrots and peas and uh, a lot of different kinds of vegetables, um, flowers, native wildflowers you can plant directly in the ground. So go ahead and try seeds, they're great. Um, do remember though that seeds will germinate fastest if the soil is warm. That means it's like the temperature in the air is like in the 60s and 70s and 80s and the soil has warmed up. It's maybe in the 70s. You'll, you'll definitely notice that seeds will germinate faster in warm soil. Uh, follow the seed packet directions as far as how deep and how far apart to plant your seeds. Water them well, just like when you plant a little a little transplant or a tree or a shrub, always water after you plant and then um, keep them moist. It's really important to keep seeds moist when they're, when they're starting to grow. And when they get bigger, you wanna do uh, what's called thinning, which is to pull them apart, pull them out. You can eat those seedlings if it's vegetables or you can toss them out, but you definitely want to thin them to the spacing that's indicated on the seed packet. So if it says they should be six inches apart, you really wanna make sure that you pull out the ones in between. And um, give it a try. Growing things from seed can be super, super fun. And then if you do grow things from seed, watch for when they come up. And you can see in this picture here on the left, uh, seedlings can be really tiny. <laughs> And a bird might see that and eat that before you see it. So keep an eye out for your seedlings when they pop up out of the ground and give them some protection from the birds and the slugs and things like that. And um, as they grow, you will take that protection away. But when they're little tiny babies, they really need, <clears throat> they really need some, some protection. So that's what I have to say about getting plants into the ground. And now we will proceed with Susan talking about caring for your garden. Thank you, Louise. All right, well, we spent the better part of the past three weeks and today talking about preparing for planting, learning about plants, learning how to get the plants into the ground. So let's say we've got our plants in the ground. So what are we gonna do now? How are we gonna make sure that they thrive? We're gonna observe our garden. When we're observing our garden, we're making sure that our plants are growing the best they possibly can. It's gonna keep our garden happy and a happy garden means a happy gardener. We want you to be happy gardeners. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna look at your garden and you're going to make sure things are going the right way. You're going to water your garden. 
you're going to weed your garden. Once you have flowering plants, you're going to deadhead those flowering plants to make sure that they continue to produce flowers. You're going to harvest the fruits of your labor. Fruit and vegetables, get out there and harvest those. You're going to prune certain plants and you're going to cut back some plants and you're going to mulch that garden to keep it moist so that you're not losing water to evaporation and you're going to control pests in the garden. So looking at the plant on the left, it looks like that plant is fine. It happens to be a Hoya. And if you look at the one on the right hand side, you'll see that that Hoya actually has a bunch of aphids on the stem. If I were out in my garden and I'd not really taken the time to take a close look at that plant, I wouldn't see that those aphids were on there sucking life out of that plant. So that's the, that's the value of looking closely at your plants regularly. It's really important to keep that garden weeded now you've got those precious plants in there. Here are two rosemary plants. So we've taken the time to make sure that the ground was weed free when we planted it, but there are still weeds in that soil and there are weed seeds that get transferred into the soil through the process of the wind blowing the seeds there, of animals dropping them there in their poop, et cetera. So even though you pulled them initially, you've got to pull them continuously. Those weeds are gonna take those vital nutrients from the plants that you want to have grow. It's easiest to get those weeds out if you start when they're small and if the soil is moist when you're pulling them up. You want to make that weed pulling a habit you have as, as, as well as the observing of plants. Now, no matter whatever technique you have chosen for your watering, be it hand watering, drip irrigation, or overhead sprinklers, you want to make sure that you are using the right amount of water for the right plant, right plant, right place, right plant, right water. For beginners, we recommend that you do hand watering um, with a hose. That way you get to have, to have that observation of what is actually going on with the plant. Or if you use drippers, you wanna make sure that those drippers are placed near the base of the plant. Because all of this is so that you are watering the root zone. These are new plants, they need to have their roots watered and you need to make sure that whatever type of irrigation you have chosen, you are getting the water to the right place. It's not getting watered if the roots are not getting wet. You do need to get that root zone wet with whatever technique you are using. How are you knowing whether or not the amount of water you are putting on the garden is the right amount? There are many techniques for checking to see how much water is being spread by your sprinkler system or by your hose. But one of the really basic ones is to actually observe that water penetration by just checking it by hand. So in the left-hand picture, you'll see that the, that line of plants is being watered with a hose and sprinkler. And I might think that when I look at that soil, it, it's wet. I've obviously watered it enough. The picture on the right shows you that despite the fact that the water looked like it had penetrated the ground on the left-hand photo, in the right, you can see it probably got down maybe a half an inch. So that is something that's telling you that you're not getting that water to the root zone of those little seedlings you're trying to start. You need to water that area again. So but does that mean you should water it longer? Not necessarily. There's a technique called pulse watering, and it means that you water briefly, uh, let the water soak in, water again and then check it again to make sure that that water has penetrated. You'll learn how much water you need to do in each one of those short watering sessions in order to get that water to penetrate the ground. Remember, you're trying to get that water to the roots of the new plants that you have put down there. So water deeply in order to get the whole root zone done. And once you've got your plants up, up there in the, in the air, you don't water them again until the soil is dry to about a one inch depth. 
And that's not for seedlings, this is for plants that are actually been transplanted and you can see that they are starting to grow. And you're gonna check their dryness by digging and taking a look at that soil. Now, if I were planting a fern, for example, I know that a fern is going to need more water than a cactus. So the amount of water I apply to a fern is going to be substantially more than the amount I apply to a cactus. So sometimes you're gonna be planting plants that are said, they call them drought tolerant. Yes, they are drought tolerant, but when they're new in the ground, they still need to have that root zone well watered so that they could spread their roots and thrive in the soil. And then as they get older, um, past the first two seasons, for example, then they are going to be much more drought tolerant. But when they're new plants, they do need to get watered. Now for more established trees and, and shrubs and other plants, you want to water at the drip line. You're not watering at the base of the tree, you're actually watering at the edge of the canopy of the plant. That's what we call the drip line. Um, this means that the water is actually getting out to the area where the roots are and not flooding the trunk of the tree. Remember when we were looking at how trees spread their roots or how plants spread their roots, it's not straight down from the trunk down to the soil. They spread them out as well. So by watering at the drip line, you're gonna get that water to the part of the tree that needs it. And it's gonna be able to absorb it best from the ground. When should you water? It's really best to water early in the morning if you can. You could avoid a lot of the problems of water settling on the plants and, and the plants and the day getting cooler, um, bringing on mildew. Um, you just really want to get those plants dry before it gets to be evening. So if you can water it early in the morning, that would be great. Ah, now we're gonna be talking about deadheading. Deadheading is the process of clipping off spent flowers, dead leaves, seed heads. Your plants will be grateful to have those uh, dead heads, those dead flower heads taken off. Your plants will look better for sure. And in many plants, deadheading will spur the plant to produce many more blooms. An example of a plant that really thrives with deadheading is the rose bush. If you leave the roses on there after they have spent and their petals start to fall off, not only does the rose bush not look very good, it will stop producing roses. So deadhead those flowers. Harvesting. Remember you put in a lot of effort to get those fruits and vegetables into your garden, you want to eat those and you want to eat them when they're ready to go. So even a day or two too long can mean the difference between a tasty vegetable and one that has a tough skin. Um, the cucumber in the far left picture, within a day or two, they could have a tougher skin. Um, the seeds inside could get a lot bigger. A squash could be hiding underneath there and grow three foot long. Well, that's sort of an exaggeration, but sometimes it seems like that. So you want to catch them when they're at their peak. Uh, the tomato, uh, you don't want it to get overripe. It might split. Uh, the kale could get too, too tough because the stalks have gotten too big. So harvest those when they're ready. Use a pair of shears to cut the cucumber from the stem and the tomato from the stem, and perhaps a, a sharp knife to cut the leaves from the kale plants. Many plants do need to have regular pruning. And really it depends upon the type of plant. Um, if you're growing fruit trees, they need to be pruned back either in the summer or in the winter, depending upon the type of fruit tree you've got. Um, some plants to be, to be pruned back in order to spur more growth on. Um, each plant is different. So if you've got a specific plant, you need to learn about how it should be pruned or cut back. If you've got a friend who's a good gardener, why not ask them to come over and, and give you a little bit of advice? And you know that you could always go to the Master Gardener website. We do have training videos there about pruning. Um, and we do periodically have actual in-person classes, or we do hope to have again, 
in-person classes where we could do demonstrations of how to prune and take care of the plants and trees in your garden. Mulching, remember we talked about mulching in great detail. You've put down the mulch, you need to maintain that mulch. So the mulch gets pounded into the ground uh, the mulch gets spread around by kids who play in the garden, etc. Keep that mulch at a depth that you started with. That's hopefully three to four inches of mulch. And that will keep the ground um, clear of weed seeds if possible. It will help it maintain moisture. Um, it's a good thing to have that mulch in the garden. So keep it up, keep up the mulching. So in conclusion, a really important part of becoming a good gardener is developing your sense of observation of the garden. You wanna look at your plants, you wanna check the soil, you wanna know what the weather is going to do. You wanna see if there are any insects out there, what animals are out there that are eating your plants, etc. Spend some time in your garden, just looking around. Take that cup of coffee out there in the morning and look at those plants, turn the leaves over, you know, Look at see if anything needs some special care that you didn't notice the day before. The more attuned you become to your garden, the more your garden will thrive. So observe it and you will be able to anticipate, anticipate its needs much better. Now that really, we hope gave you a, a good feeling of what you wanna do in your first garden. And now I'd like to turn it over to our program coordinator, Catherine, who has a message for us all. Thank you, Ruben. Um, I am not seeing the slide. You see it now, Catherine? Yeah, yeah. Just can you just go back, um, please? Oh, that's right. We need slide control. Sorry. Okay, you can control. All right, great. Thank you so much. So I um, won't take up too much of your time for a question and answer. Um, as Susan said, I am the Master Gardener Program Coordinator. So I am um, one of many coordinators in uh, California. There's a Master Gardener Program in almost every county. And all of the county Master Gardener Programs, no matter where uh, they're from in the state, participate in a statewide evaluation. And we like to say um, that this is very important for helping us as the Master Gardener Program to grow. So what that means is that um, we have a follow-up survey that will come to you via email three months after the class. So the point of the survey is to assess any behavior changes that you've made as a result of what you've learned here in class. So um, this is our uh, basic information here about the survey. It's really simple. Um, it helps us to uh, inform um, how well we're doing and um, what we could be doing better or more of. The other important thing to notice here is that second to last sentence, we do not sell or share your contact information with anyone. Uh, so it's completely anonymous and confidential. However, if you do not wish to receive the survey, you can opt out by emailing mgevaluation at ucanr.org. And all you have to say is please remove me from your email list and then um, you will not receive the survey. So um, we really, really appreciate this valuable information that you can give us. Uh, so we hope you will participate and um, hopefully you can make some good positive changes in your garden after uh, taking this class. So thank you so much. Uh, now we'll hear from um, Anne for Q&A, questions and answers. Thank you, Catherine. We have a, a number of questions, and maybe I'll just start with the with the the last ones um, are about um, sterilizing 
tools and also cleaning versus sterilizing nursery pots and uh, packs. About the tools, maybe Paul, could you answer that? Um, uh, do you what's what do you what do you do with sterilizing your tools? Do you do it or not? In what case would you do it? I don't, but then I don't do much uh, grafting. I think the sterilization case is mostly for, for grafting and uh, pruning. Mm -hmm. um, I think a, an alcohol wash is in a spray bottle. If you spray your pruners before you you uh, you prune, that's that, that's pretty good. Um, see if any other folks have ideas. But you do you use it routinely when you're when you're um, pruning. Do you sterilize your tools then? Probably just before I use it mm -hmm. on a tree, but um, I think that's pretty pretty common. I, I I would say that if you're gonna take that tool into some other buddy's uh, other person's garden or another place, I, I don't think you want to take whatever your garden has and give it to that other one. So I that certainly be a situation where I'd want to you know clean up and sterilize the tools before I left the property. Mm -hmm. Or if you knew you were pruning a tree that had some disease yeah. on it, yeah. you want yeah. to sterilize the, the tools afterwards. And I agree with Paul that a, an alcohol bottle, a, a bottle of isopropyl alcohol with a spray on it is a good way to sterilize the tool. Mm -hmm. Now, what about um, the pots and trays and such that that um, when you when you when you transplant a pot and you want to save that pot to use again, do you um, sterilize that or do you just clean it up? I, I can I can talk to that because yeah, I, I, I recycle hundreds of uh, plastic pots, and the worst thing that can happen when you're uh, planting from seed is the damping off. And one of the reasons of the damping off is you get these foliar diseases that uh, is, is left in the pot. So what I do, and I think what's recommended, is you sterilize or clean that pot with one part bleach and nine parts or 10 parts water and give them a really good brushing and soaking and then let them dry in the sun for a day or two. Uh, because having a, a clean pot is so important for those delicate seedlings and uh, and, and the other thing is you, you, you just don't, don't ever put soil from your garden into those pots because it, it can contain pathogens. So two things, don't use garden soil and uh, make sure you, uh, you sterilize them with a, a bleach water uh, solution. Okay, thank you. Um, Louise, can I, I, yeah. can I say one thing before I forget? Um, I forgot to say when I was talking about sheep mulching is that the reason you put down the cardboard on top of the weeds and then you cover it with compost and mulch is and wet it a little bit, everything will decompose. So you're never going to remove that cardboard. It's going to turn into basically mulch and become part of the soil. So you never have to go back and remove the cardboard. I just wanted to make that clear. Mm -hmm. Yes. I know we've done that in our yard and it's worked very well. Eventually the cardboard just decays. Mm -hmm. Um, someone just sent in, uh, let's see, a question about, I'm not sure I understand this one, what to do when a plant dries off completely from the stem, not just the leaves, in spite of watering? It Sounds might like be dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's dead to me when you have a dried up. Yeah, maybe you could... it, it's possible that it could be a, the, a type of perennial that dies in the winter and comes back in the spring. So that's a matter of knowing what type of plant it is. Is it an annual or a perennial? Um, if it doesn't grow back eventually, then that probably means it's dead. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, here's a question that just came in about potting soil and gnats in the potting soil. I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a common problem, I think, that I've heard there of. Shouldn't, there shouldn't be gnats in the potting soil when you buy it. If there, is, if there is, I would take it back to the nursery um, if, if it came with that. If you have, if you have gnats that are, grow, that are in your plants, like in your seedlings, if you're growing seedlings indoors, 
um, I, I have used um, those little yellow sticky things yeah. to, to catch yeah. them before. Mm -hmm. Often that's a problem of maybe overwatering because you get algae on the surface of the soil and actually the gnats are eating the algae. Here's, a, here's another question about mulch. We have some of the, um, the, the person wanted to know, this is a question I'm interested in too, whether using wood mulch um, might increase your chance of having termites. Does anybody? I, I, I have an opinion about that, or not an opinion, <laughs> but um, termites are endemic to our area, they live here already. They're already in your soil. Yeah. Um, whether you put wood mulch on top doesn't make any difference. They're all, the, the termites are already there. Mm -hmm. um, the very important thing though, is to not let the wood, wood of any kind, whether it's mulch or, you know, logs or old two by fours, um, not, no wood should ever contact the foundation of your house. So you would always wanna keep the mulch pulled back from the foundation. Um, or soil. Soil shouldn't contact the, the wood part of your house at all. So, but, but the, the mulch isn't going to bring more termites in. The termites are already there. Yeah. Thank you. Then we have, we have a couple of questions, uh, another about pests, about aphids. And I know they, people mentioned how how difficult it is to get rid of aphids sometimes just by hosing them because they they really stick to the plant um and i don't know i mean sometimes i find myself just if it's a small plant i just kind of squish the aphids and take them off that way but does does anybody have another advice i on a plant where i could see them and i can't hose them off i'll often take a paper towel and just run it along the plant yeah. Yeah. and try and gather them up that way. I th they, they're, um, they produce a sort of sticky honeydew. Yes. That uh, does make them sometimes difficult to hose down. Yeah, but, you know, taking some sort of a cloth or a paper towel, um, you could get rid of them that way. You want to talk it about the, the, use, talk, the use of ladybugs and uh, how they eat once and fly away? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good idea, but... It, it, it doesn't work very well. There was um, a couple of questions about um, whether there's a benefit to in-ground gardening compared to doing raised beds or, you know, does anybody want to go into the pros and cons of each? Uh, I don't have any raised beds. I don't, I only do in-ground gardening. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason I don't have any raised beds is because the, area that I garden in is either fruit trees, which I want to have in the soil, or, or my vegetable garden area is so narrow that if I were to try and build a raised bed, I would be cutting myself off for almost a, you know, six inches of my precious garden in the sun. So that's why I do in-ground in -ground gardening. It's, you know, it's a personal preference. I. I'd like to say that that we do uh, in-ground gardening too, and and um, I do it partly because I learned when I came here how rich the clay soil is um, in Santa Clara County. It's got all lots of nutrients in it, and what it all it needs is um, something to make it more uh, to lighten it and to add an organic material. So we just dig in a lot of compost, and it's done very well. I, I think one advantage it has over the raised beds and the soil that you typically put in the raised beds is that it, it holds the moisture better. I've noticed that from having worked in some demo gardens with raised beds. But on the other hand, there are many advantages of the raised garden, of raised beds too. Does, does one of you want to speak to that? Well, I have nothing but raised beds. So okay. So so maybe I'm biased, but... Uh, a couple of things. One is, it seems like it's easier to amend. Uh, I mean, you have kind of a continuous space that you can throw in compost after each crop and, uh, and, and you put cover crops in there. It's easier to work. If, if you raise it a little bit higher, it's a lot easier. You don't have to bend over as far. So there, there is that convenience. Uh, I, I just find it easier to manage. Mm -hmm. And it, it, aesthetically, it, sort of feels better for me to look at the raised bed. So 
that's kind of some of my views. Yeah, note that even with the raised vats, you 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 do need to amend it. You know, whether whether you have one in ground or a raised bed, you're going to still have to amend it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another point is if you're growing something that requires radically different soil texture, mm -hmm. then you uh, could be better off with a raised bed. If you need, if you growing plants there that need very good drainage, mm -hmm. and you want a sandier soil, um, it's practically as easy to do that in a raised bed than um, trying to make it work in a in a clay environment. And it's a lot easier to have some kind of systematic crop rotation. You, you know, you number the beds and then bed one, uh, you know, get something else the next year and you kind of move it around. So it, it makes that a little bit simpler. Yeah, if you want to protect with hardware cloth, it's much easier just to lay out a piece of hardware cloth. On the yeah, bed. that's interesting. That's a good point too. Dig four feet into the ground. Um, there were questions, someone asked, how can I determine what type of soil I have? Um, do you have- where it, A lot of it might depend on where you live, yeah. um, but if your soil, if you could make pottery out of your soil, it's clay. <laughs> Literally, I've, I've made pots out of my soil. So um, a, lot of the, a lot of the areas of not just, Santa Clara County, but uh, California in general, many areas have clay soil. Um, if you if you pick up the soil in when it's moist in your hand and you squeeze it tight, and like Denise kind of showed, if it stays in a really tight blob that feels like pottering pottery clay, that then you definitely have clay. If it crumbles or it won't stick together, then you have um, maybe some loam or something more silty that's that's looser chances are you have a good amount of clay it's a question about about what uh, is there a special type of wood mulch to use is grape must okay to use as compost mulch I think and i think it would help if you would um Tell one of us to pick which okay. pick one of us to, to answer because then we're, we're we're I think we're afraid of stepping on each other's right. Okay, I'm gonna. <laughs> okay, how about um, Paul? Why don't you answer that? So remind me the question again. I was looking. Okay, at so is there a question. special type of wood mulch to use? Is grape must okay to use as a compost mulch or mulch? Great must. Are we talking about? Great pumice. I think that's what they, they, they mean, mm -hmm. I suspect, yeah. I wouldn't say that's a mulch because I think it's, it's going to decompose very quickly. Um, but generally, mulch is anything that will hang around long enough. Mm -hmm. so, so a compost, it would be good for the compost. It would be good for compost, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, the wood's not really an active ingredient so much in the mulch. It's more of a protective layer over the soil. I mean, the wood will break down, but it's not it's not a critical part of the process. I think we discussed that another week too. That 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 yeah. basically any kind of uh, chipped wood can be used as mulch or any kind of leaves. There weren't. Um... Yeah, I mean, you can have rubber, right, as well, even. Yeah. Um, have Have any of you used grow bags, um, Louise? Have you? Do you know? Are you aware of grow bags? My. I have not used them a lot, but my daughter did her entire COVID vegetable garden in grow bags, and it was oh. fabulous. <laughs> they're, they're, they're she grew a ton of stuff. Yeah, we, we use them a lot in the UK. Yeah. She had ones that were small, and she had some that were, I swear, they were 36 inches across. And she's using them again this year. She's used them two and a half years. Wow. Yeah. Um, Compo there's a question about compost, and I would suggest you look uh, look on our hand um, on the handouts. There's a link to the Santa uh, Santa Clara County composting, or just um, they have an excellent website and even classes on composting. Um, okay, a question about hard water. 
let's say bob do you know anything about about that um if you have no. very hard water should you avoid using it you know i don't know anything about hard or soft water i, I don't have any water softener in any of my homes so <laughs> yeah yeah we we i think uh i know we have quite a, a hard well water so this is a person that doesn't unfortunately i think all of us except possibly we use city water. So we're not familiar with it. That would be a good question to send to our help desk. Yeah. So, yeah, I have I have uh, very hard well water. Oh, and, you, okay. um, but I, I haven't been, I don't know what the person is trying to grow and mm -hmm. I have not been growing vegetables. So I don't have any experience with it. Okay. Yeah, but I, I suggest um, send, it, uh, send a question about that into the help desk and see what they come up with. Try it and see. That's Excuse me. Of, I would say try it and see. That's a lot of gardening. It's experimentation. Yeah, a hard water can plug up your um, your irrigation lines. Yes. That, can. That, uh, so that can be a problem. Oh boy, there are there is a lot of I you know I thank you for all your questions and I want to remind you again about the help desk so if you don't get your your question answered or certainly if you have more please use our help desk um, because we're about to run out of time but let's see you best to raise breads oh God here's one this is for Louise um, what kind of garden gloves do you look for they had asked about oh. them. <laughs> I think we don't usually mention brands, so I was just saying. Yeah, we don't usually mention brands. So I, I would describe them as fabric with nitrile, nitrile um, palms and fingers. They're pretty close fitting. Okay, they've asked about that. They helped us go to our website, which is um, MG Santa Clara. Um, uh, let me be sure I no, that's not. I'm going to go to the handy links and then I'm going to put it in the. Um, it's basically the link that for the handouts without handouts. That's our website. And you go there and you'll see on the website where you can type in your your questions to the help desk or call that you'll see the phone number there too. So oh, I think there's so many questions. <laughs> yes, there are. Do you want to do you want to hold? I know Louise, you could answer. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> But I think we're gonna we're gonna have to. So I just want to say there's one somebody asked about whether they had all these old leaves that accumulated under bushes for years and could they use that as mulch? I I'm sure they could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a good way to, when you clear things out. You 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 can you have lots of mulch there, and if you have a chipper, you could chip the wood. I mean, it's an excellent way to recycle things. That's right. Just put a little nitrogen in there, and you're good to go. Yep, that's right. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much, and um, you know, keep in touch. Um, look, do look at our web our website. It says, "Is there an in person?" Um, no. I just want to answer that no. right right now. There isn't. We did right. have pre COVID. There were certain days you could go in to the help desk, and we we may uh, get back to that again. But keep uh keep checking our website and i'm sure if we go if, when we go back to in person it will be announced there so thank you for coming to our classes and we hope to see you again <laughs>